All right, good morning once again. Uh, if you have your Bible, if you would turn to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 10. This morning we're going to be in verses 9 to 16. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 9 to 16. The title of the sermon is Turned into Another Man. Turned into Another Man. So let's read the text, open us in a word of prayer, and then we will jump into the sermon this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 10, beginning in verse 9, if you'll follow along in your copy of God's word. When he, being Saul, turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all these signs came to pass that day. When they came to Gibeah, behold, a group of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God rushed upon him, and he prophesied among them. And when all who knew him previously saw how he prophesied with the prophets, the people said to one another, What has come over the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And a man of the place answered, And who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? When they had finished prophesying, he came to the high place. Saul's uncle said to him and to his servant, Where did you go? And he said, To seek the donkeys. And when we saw that they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, Please tell me what Samuel said to you. And Saul said to his uncle, he told us plainly that the donkeys had been found. But about the matter of the kingdom of which Samuel had spoken, he did not tell him anything. Let's pray. God, as we continue to look at this figure, um, Israel's first king, Saul, Lord, I pray that you would continue to help us to learn from his life, learn from his mistakes, and to learn from um, you, God, and what kind of God that you are, that you are a God to be feared. You are a God who is kind and merciful and gracious and compassionate. Beyond belief, you are a God, and you are a God to be feared and obeyed. And so, God, help us to learn from the life of Saul um, help us to feel the weight of his story as we work our way through it. And help us to, to see the comparisons and contrasts this morning between him being turned into another man and us being turned into another man or woman. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, if you're visiting with us this morning or joining us and uh, haven't been here for the past few weeks, we have been going through the book of First Samuel. And last week we made it to uh, the figure of Saul, uh, such a important person in the history of Israel and tragic person in the history of Israel. And we just started looking at him last week. And so we're kind of in the middle of the story. And so let me give the context to bring us all up to speed. And then we'll get into the exposition of our text that we just read. And then I'll give you points of application uh, from this story this morning. Uh, Saul was a figure that we're introduced to, and he had looked for some lost donkeys, but he couldn't find them. And so instead, he went to go seek the man of God, Samuel. And when he gets there, he spends the night with Samuel. And when Saul wakes up in the morning, his life is forever changed. Samuel anoints Saul as the new king of Israel. It would appear that Saul is perhaps having difficulty accepting this. And so Samuel gives him three signs so that he would know that this is really happening. We looked at those three signs last week and this morning we will see if in fact they are fulfilled. Now more miraculous than the signs is what Samuel says to Saul. God is with you. This is the greatest promise that any human being could ever be given. The promise of God's presence. But the juxtaposition of verse 7 and verse 8 is uncanny. Verse 7 contains this glorious statement, God is with you. But verse 8 contains instructions that Saul will fail to follow causing God to depart from him. Now, last week, I skipped over verse 6, or part of verse 6, because I wanted to address it this week. So let's look at verse 6 
I'll, I'll read the whole verse, but I'm just going to look at one part, the part I skipped over. Then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be turned into another man. Now, I skipped over that phrase. I, I went home last week after the sermon, and my wife told me, she was like, you skipped over the part I was looking forward to. And I was like, well, we'll get there. What does this mean? You will be turned into another man. The Hebrew word for turned can signify a change in direction, but it can also be used to signify a change in nature. It's the same word used of Moses when his staff was turned into a serpent. The word turned there, same word. Or when the Nile was turned into blood, same exact word. It can be translated overturned. So in other words, God overturned who Saul was. Now I want you to notice two aspects of this phrase. Number one, who is Saul turned into? Who's he turned into? Another man. It's not just that Saul is given another gift, but he will actually be turned into another man altogether. And then two, notice the voice. The Hebrew is nafal. It's what we today call the passive voice, meaning God is the one who is doing this. Saul is not choosing for the spirit to come upon him. The spirit is deciding to rush upon him. Saul is not going to prophecy school to learn how to prophesy. The spirit is causing him to prophesy. Saul's not choosing to become another man. God is choosing for him. You will become another man, Saul. And that's what happens. And then now look at verse 9. When he turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all these signs came to pass that day. Now I want you to consider this. Here is Saul and Samuel talking face to face. And when Saul turns his back, in that turning, God gives him another heart. Notice four aspects of this. Number one, God gave. Literally, God changed. God overturned. The, the, the word here for gave is actually the same Hebrew word in verse 6 of turned. God turned him into another man. God turned his heart. Two, notice the voice here. This time it's active, meaning God changed Saul has no active role in this process. God is the one who is changing Saul's heart. Number three, notice what kind of heart is he given? Another heart. Not just a better heart, but another heart. And number four, I want you to see the, the connection of the phrases another man and another heart. If you like to write in your Bible, you could even circle those two phrases and draw arrows to them. Another man, another heart. Because I think they're synonymous. I think that's the idea. Another man, another heart. In other words, your heart is who you are. You want to know who somebody is? You want to know who you are? Your heart is who you are. This is the only place in the Old Testament where this phrase is used. Another heart. In Ezekiel, we are told that God would give us a new heart but this is the only place where this phrase is used, another heart. As Saul walks away as another man with another heart, all the signs that were promised to him come true that day. Remember, this is the litmus test for a true prophet of the Lord. You want to know, there were, there were all kinds of prophets today. There are still prophets today. You want to know who's a true prophet? Well, see if what they say comes true. And here we see that Samuel is a true prophet of the Lord. The first sign came true in verse 2. The second sign came true in verses 3 to 4. And then the narrator gives us details about the third sign. Verse 10. Let's read it. When they came to Gibeah, behold, a group of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God rushed upon him, and he prophesied among them. Now this one verse, six questions arise from this one verse. Let me, let me give you all the questions up front. Number one, who is this group of prophets? Number two, what exactly is a prophet? Number three, is the Spirit of God here the same thing as the Holy Spirit in the New Testament? Number four, what does it mean that it rushed upon him? 
And how is that different than residing in him? Five, does this mean that Saul was saved here? Six, what does it mean that Saul prophesied among them? This is, when you read the word, this is how you should study the word. You read a verse, you write down every question you can think of, and then you go looking for answers to those questions. All right, you can do this. So let's look at those one at a time. Number one, who is this group of prophets? We are not told. We don't know. We know that Samuel is not the only prophet of the Lord. Back in 1 Samuel 2.27, if you remember, there came a man of God to Eli. Now, as I mentioned last week, seer, man of God, prophet are all used interchangeably. We're not to see a distinction between those three terms. We see a company of prophets in 1 Samuel 19, 20. Even when Elijah, remember Elijah thought he was the only prophet left. And he's weeping about that and and, uh, kind of self-pity. And God assures him, you're not the only prophet. God was preserving other prophets. Remember Obadiah? Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets of the Lord, hid them by fifties in caves. So even though we are brought in on the stories of uh, Elijah and Elisha and Samuel and Jeremiah and Isaiah, there was frequently a band of prophets in addition to those prophets. Number two, second question, what exactly is a prophet? I know that seems like a simple question, but one that maybe do we know the answer to? What is a prophet? The shortest definition is one who proclaims inspired utterances on behalf of God. Let me say that again. The shortest definition of a prophet is one who proclaims inspired utterances on behalf of God. Now that's an Old Testament definition. Old Testament definition. It was almost always males, but in the Old Testament, there are several examples of prophetesses. Miriam, Deborah, Holda, and possibly Isaiah's wife. Three, is the Spirit of God here the same thing as the Holy Spirit in the New Testament? I would argue yes. We see the phrase Spirit of God and Spirit of the Lord 36 times in the Old Testament. So if you ever wanted to know, what was the Holy Spirit doing before Pentecost? Before Jesus spent the Holy Spirit, what was the third member of the Trinity doing for these 10,000 years? What was he doing? Well, go to a search engine and put in quotation marks, Spirit of God or Spirit of the Lord in the Old Testament, and you'll have 36 passages to know what was the Holy Spirit doing in the Old Testament. Four, what does it mean that it rushed upon him? And how is this different than residing in him? As I mentioned last week, the Hebrew word for rush is normally translated prosper, succeed, triumph, victorious, thrive. In the Old Testament, the Spirit would temporarily rush upon a person to accomplish a particular task. He would often give them supernatural abilities or gifts. Kind of like, you know, Superman walks into the telephone booth, Clark Kent, and comes out Superman, right? The... Samson is not strong in and of himself. He's just like you and me. The spirit rushes upon him, and then he has power to kill a lion with his bare hands. Now, how is this different than residing in? How is that different? What's the difference between your clothes and your skin? You can take your clothes on and off. Your skin is there to stay. It's yours. It's there. Five. Does this mean that Saul was saved here? Or to use a New Testament term, does this mean that Saul was justified? God turned him into another man, gave him another heart. The spirit is coming upon him. This sounds like salvation. This sounds like justification. Well, let's be clear that in the New Testament, justification, meaning that the 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 act of God declaring us righteous, justification, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, they happen simultaneously, and they are dependent on one another. 
Meaning, everyone who is justified has the Holy Spirit. And everyone who has the Holy Spirit is justified. They are dependent on one another. They happen simultaneously. Romans 8, 9. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But that's not how it worked in the Old Testament. That's not how it worked in the Old Testament. Justification in the Old Testament did not coincide with the Spirit rushing upon a person. And the Spirit rushing upon a person did not coincide with justification. So no, Saul is not justified here. He's not counted righteous here. And six, what does it mean that Saul prophesied among them? Or in general, what does it mean in verse 5 when there's these group of prophets who are prophesying? Like, what did that look like? I mean, it looks like a a praise team. They've got music. So what does it look like that they're prophesying? Um, To be fair, there's a lot of mystery here. This is debatable. Uh, I don't know that I have a good grasp of what it looked like. But here's what Simon Parker writes. I think this is as good an answer as I found in my research. Here's what Simon Parker writes. In the first passage, the behavior is a company, perhaps fostered by music. It is interpreted as a radical transformation of the personality and may confer extraordinary powers on the person so affected. According to the second, it may entail stripping off of one's clothes and may issue in a coma. And both its onset is described as an invasion or at least as a visitation by a divine spirit. It is a group behavior and is contagious. It seems clear that it has to do with some kind of trance state or altered state of consciousness. Now, if you're wondering, where did the stripping off the clothes part come from? We'll get there. It's what Saul does later when he prophesies. We'll get there. So all that to say, um, I don't know what this looked like, but to to be sure it looked like something from out of this world. It looked like this person began to behave a way and to speak a way and to act in a way that was not like anything they had ever seen before. All right, that's as best as I can tell you. Verse 11, and when all who knew him previously saw how he prophesied with the prophets, the people said to one another, what has come over the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Now, all of Saul's family and friends who knew him previously knew that Saul had never prophesied before. But here he is prophesying with a band of prophets. It was so powerful that the people responded, what has come over him? This would be like if one day we got on YouTube and we saw one of our guys preaching at a Christian conference of 20,000 as though Charles Spurgeon had risen from the dead. And we would think, where did this come from? And so they are wondering, is Saul now a prophet? The son of Kish was previously looking for just some lost donkeys. And now he's with this band of prophets. So what's come over him? Verse 12, and a man of the place answered, and who is their father? Therefore, it became a proverb. Is Saul also among the prophets? So a man of the place asked the question, who is their father? Now, why does he ask this question? There's two ways to take this question, either neutral or negative. It could just be neutral. It could just be a general question where he's just curious, like, who's who's their father? Or it could be negative. It could be a pejorative comment to suggest illegitimacy. Um, I tend to think it's negative, but you be the judge. There are arguments for both. It's hard to say. Interesting, though, they ask the same question about Jesus. In coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue. So they were astonished, and they said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Are not all his sisters with us? Where where did this man get all this wisdom and all these things? And they took offense at him. 
But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. Another time, the Jews marveled, saying, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? And Jesus answered them, my teaching is not my own, but his who sent me. Just as Jesus' teaching was not his own, so Saul's prophecy is not his own, but the spirit of God's. This phrase is Saul also among the prophets. The narrator says it became a proverb. What does that mean it became a proverb? Uh, You have to remember that the word proverb has many definitions, many usages, many nuances. Here's how I think the word proverb is being used here in this context. I think the best definition of proverb here in this context is a short, pithy saying in common use. A short, pithy saying in common use. Today, we we don't use the word proverb. We use the word catchphrase. That's what it is. Proverb here is being used as a catchphrase. We have catchphrases, you know, it's like there's more than one way to skin a cat or don't count your chickens before they hatch. You can tell I'm from the South. This phrase will be repeated in 1 Samuel 19, 24, where Saul strips off his clothes and he too prophesied before Samuel and he lay naked all that day and all that night. We'll get there. Verse 13. When he had finished prophesying, he came to the high place. Now, normally we would just glance right over this verse, but I want you to hone in on this word, finished. Saul did not continue to prophesy. This is similar to the 70 elders in Numbers. Remember, as soon as the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied but they did not continue doing it. Numbers eleven twenty five. 25. Saul will not prophesy again in his life that we know of in the positive sense. He will prophesy two more times, but not in the positive sense. The next time he prophesies will be a raving madness. When we get there, that word for Saul was in a rave, it's the same word as prophesy. He will prophesy in a raving madness when a harmful spirit from God rushes upon him And he prophesies. The last time will not be a sign of his kingship, but will be a sign of his rejection and his humiliation, where he strips down and lays naked all night long. When he finishes his prophecy, he goes to the high place, presumably for the sacrifice. When he gets there, verses 14 to 16, he meets his uncle there. Now, his uncle is most likely Ner. Ner is the father of Abner. Av, we spell it A-B, but Av is father. That's why Abraham is Avraham, father of many nations. Ner is the father of Abner. We'll get to Abner later. Important character in the book. The main question we have here is why did Saul respond the way that he did? His uncle asked him, what did Samuel tell you? And Saul just mentions the donkeys. Why? Was he exercising discretion or deception? Was he exercising caution or fear? You have to be the judge. I don't know. Application. What do we do with this text? Uh, I'm going to give you six comparisons or contrasts with Saul in the Old Testament and Christians in the New Testament. Six comparisons, contrasts between Saul in the Old Testament and Christians in the New Testament. Here they are. Number one, in Christ, we do not become better versions of ourself. We become a different self. In Christ, We do not become better versions of ourself. We become a different self. Samuel said that Saul would become another man and he would be given another heart. This is what happens when Christ graciously invades our life. 
You know, it's not uncommon for Christians to think of Jesus as helping them to become better versions of themselves. You hear it. You hear people say, you know, why are you a Christian? Or how did you be, what, what, what does it mean for you to be a Christian? And Jesus helps us to become more kind, more loving, more patient, more generous. And although this is gloriously true, Jesus did not die on the cross to make us better versions of ourselves, but to change ourselves, to become another person. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Friend, are you a new creation? Not just a better person, but a different person altogether. Do you meet up with people that you went to high school with or college with and they say, you're a different person? Do you meet up with family members that you knew growing up And they knew one version of you. And now when they see you, they say, you're a different person. Do you meet up with old coworkers and they say, you're different? I was watching a movie last night. I haven't watched it in like 21, 22 years. I only made it like five minutes into it. Um, I honestly thought the movie was rated PG-13 and the language was just filthy. And I had no recollection of that at all, like none. And I was like, how did I miss this? Like, I I swore this movie was PG-13. You know how I missed it? Last time I watched it was when I was lost. You don't even hear it when you're lost. You don't even recognize it. So 21 years will do. So 21 years of the Spirit sanctifying you will do. Jesus didn't come to make us better versions of ourselves. He came to make us a different self. Two, regeneration is completely a work of God. Regeneration is completely a work of God. As I mentioned in the exposition, the Spirit rushes upon Saul. The Spirit doesn't ask permission. He simply comes upon Saul. God changes Saul into another man. Saul didn't choose this. God chose it for him. God overturns Saul's heart. He gives him a new one. Saul didn't choose this. God did it for him. Do you know why so many professing Christians are not absolutely floored by the fact that they are saved? Why so many describe their salvation experience the same way they describe getting into college or getting their first job? Because we think we chose this. We think we chose this. We think that in some measure, we had something to do with our salvation. You hear it in the phrase, I asked Jesus to come into my heart. God decides when he comes into your heart. He doesn't ask permission. When he wills to save you, you will be saved. When God turns us into a new man or a new woman, when he gives us a new heart, do you know what happens? Ezekiel 37 happens. Hold your spot here and turn with me to Ezekiel 37.
Ezekiel 37, I want you to read with me verses 1 to 14. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out into the, in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. And then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound and behold, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked and behold, there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath and breathe on these slain so that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath came into them and they lived And they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. And then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and I will raise you up from your graves. O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you up from your graves. O my people, and I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land and then you shall know that I am the Lord I have spoken and I will do it declares the Lord That's a parable of every one of our salvation. What happened when you got saved? That happened. God speaks to these dead bones and he says, live. Three, God doesn't want to temporarily change our heart, but to permanently give us a new heart. God doesn't want to temporarily change our heart, but to permanently give us a new heart. As I mentioned before, this phrase, another heart, I don't think is the same meaning as the phrase in Ezekiel 36, new heart. Saul was given another heart Another heart, but I don't think he was given the new heart promise in Ezekiel 36. How do we know this? Because he goes back to his old heart. But God promised in Ezekiel 36, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. I want to challenge us, church body. Don't be like Saul. Where change is something that only happens temporarily. Don't be like Saul, where change is something that only happens temporarily. For Saul, it was as long as the Spirit was rushing upon him. As long as the Spirit rushed upon him, he was good. But when the Spirit didn't rush upon him, he was not good. 
Now for us, it might be as long as we are at church or around other Christians or on a retreat or a Christian conference. As long as we are being discipled, as long as we are serving in the church body, But when these things are removed, just like when the Spirit was removed from Saul, we go back to old ways. This is what happened with with COVID the past year and a half. I was talking to a friend about this. For so many Christians, not just at this church, all across America, for so many Christians, our Christianity is so intertwined with structure church services, serving, all these things that we do, that when that gets removed, what we were standing on, because we weren't standing on Christ, we were standing on structure, we were standing on serving, we were standing on church services, we were standing on all these things that are not Christ, and when it gets removed, what are we standing on? This is why so many Christians across America struggled the past year and a half, including me. Believe me, I stand on this. It was revealing of where is my faith and what am I standing upon? Friend, God is willing to give you a new heart, a new spirit, one that is not temporary, but one that is permanently eternal and eternally permanent. A heart that will put your hand to the plow and never look back. God wants to give you that. Four. God has given us his spirit to enable and empower us to prophesy. God has given us his spirit to enable and empower us to prophesy. The spirit came upon Saul and Saul prophesied. Saul was not a prophet. He was so much not a prophet that the people said, is Saul also among the prophets? You can almost hear the kind of like negative tone in their voice. Not, I don't think they're saying it like, is Saul also among the... I, I think they're saying it the other way. Is Saul also among the prophets? It became a catchphrase. A catchphrase for what? It became a catchphrase for anything that was unbelievable. But when the Spirit came upon him, he had no choice but to prophesy. Today, for those in Christ... We are not waiting for the Spirit to come upon us. We're not waiting. God has prophesied through Joel, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. This came true at Pentecost. Brothers and sisters, if you are in Christ, you have the Spirit of God Almighty residing within you. And if the Spirit of God resides within you, you have the ability and the power to prophesy. Now, granted, some have the gift of prophecy, meaning they're given extraordinary grace to do this, to exercise this gift. But everyone who has the Spirit has the ability and the power to prophesy. Now, just as a side note, If you're saying, what is prophecy today? What does that mean? What do you, like, you want me to dance around like Saul did? No, hopefully not. There are entire books written on this. What is prophecy today? What is New Testament prophecies? Entire books written on this. So um, the shortest, clearest, and most comprehensive definition that I have found on this, and I looked far and wide, is by John Piper. Of course, it's by John Piper. And it's not short. What is New Testament prophecy? Here it is. A regulated message or report in human words, usually made to the gathered believers, based on a spontaneous personal revelation from the Holy Spirit for the purpose of edification, encouragement, 
consolation, conviction, or guidance, but not necessarily free from a mixture of human error and thus needing assessment on the base of apostolic biblical teaching and mature spiritual wisdom. Now that's a lot. But here's what I want you to take away from that. All of you who have the Spirit of God dwelling inside of you, all of you have the ability and the power to do that. All of you who have the Spirit. Five. God has given us prophecy in part so that we would use it as an evangelistic witness. God has given us prophecy in part so that we would use it as an evangelistic witness. Now, where do I get that from? Saul's actions, his new prophecies, his new self, his new heart, they were so strange to those who knew him previously that they said, what has come over the son of Kish? They knew one version of Saul. They maybe grew up with him. They probably farmed with him and ate with him and, and did business with him and talked with him. But this man, this man was altogether different. That is one way that prophecy today is supposed to function as an evangelistic witness. In the church at Corinth, they were striving for manifestations of the Spirit. They thought that speaking in tongues would give evidence to how spiritual they were. Now, we do the same thing today in churches. Not, usually not with tongues, sometimes. But usually not with tongues. We do the same thing today. Maybe through numbers, buildings, programs, charismatic speakers, personalities of preachers, talent of musicians, Numbers of baptisms, number of professions of faith, none of which necessarily testify to the power of the Spirit. None of which necessarily testify to the world that God is great and greatly to be praised. But Paul says, if therefore the whole church come together and all speak in tongues and an outsider or unbeliever enter, Will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship God and he will declare that God is really among you. God has given us prophecy today in part that we would use it as an evangelistic witness to the lost world that when we gather and all of us are speaking through the spirit of God almighty that when a visitor or guest comes in these doors and they hear us speaking as though God Almighty dwells inside of us, they would say, surely God is among these people. Six, last point. The empowering of the Spirit never has to cease or be finished for those in Christ. The empowering of the Spirit never has to cease or be finished for those in Christ. God took some of the spirit that was on Moses and he put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. But they did not continue doing it. The spirit rushed upon Samson three times, giving him strength to kill a lion, 30 men in Ashkelon, and a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. But the Lord departed from Samson. The spirit came upon Balaam causing him to prophesy against Moab and for Israel. But Balaam did not continue doing it. And the Spirit rushed upon Saul, causing him to prophesy with this band of prophets. But his prophecy finished. It came to an end. 
But this is not the case for us today. For us in Christ, this is not the case. Sam Storms has made a compelling case that the Holy Spirit and the power of God working in us are almost synonymous in the Bible. That the Holy Spirit and the power of God working in us are used synonymously in the Bible. We see that in the Old Testament, the people were dependent on the Spirit to rush upon them, to have power, to do the work of God. We are no longer dependent on that. We are no longer dependent on the Spirit to rush upon us for power. Why? Because we have power. We have continuous access to power. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Acts 1, 8. Jesus told the disciples, stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Luke 24. Brother and sister, you don't have to wait for power to come upon you. It resides within you. And once you walk in that power, you don't have to fear that it will be taken away from you. You will always have access to this power. Storms may come, but there are no power outages in the kingdom. The blood of Jesus Christ is a perpetual generator giving us access to the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We may walk in weakness, but we walk in a powerful weakness. Let's pray.